Are you ready to get the support you need for your author career and life? Join international indie bestseller Angela J. Ford and fantasy author Stephanie Wabwa as they talk all things writing, publishing, and the real life of an indie author. Welcome to the Indie Author Lifestyle Show. Living your best indie life starts here. Welcome to the Indie Author Lifestyle Show. This is episode 13 and happy new year. It is 2020 and we're so excited about the new year. Stephanie, how are you doing and what are some of your goals for this brand new year? Hello, Angela and happy new year. I'm doing jazz hands for all of you listeners who are not a fan of video, so you can't see me kind of like throwing magical confetti everywhere, but it is 2020. So I'm really pumped, as you can tell, because all the things, right? It's a brand new year. That means books and books and books will be written. So my strategies, I'm definitely focusing as far as when it comes to my email list, All energy is still focused on that episodic story just because it really keeps my readers engaged, you know, and it's fun just having conversations with them like, oh, I hope everybody chooses this. I really want this to win out. I'm like, we shall see. So I'll be ramping up um, marketing efforts as far as building my list through that. Um, Also, I will have my uh, my short story will be out. And so that will be my, what I call my freemium in the sense that I'm not going to charge for it. It will be a freebie, but it is, you know, it's not just like some haphazard story that I'm throwing out there. Um, This short story is actually the intro to the Project Fire series, which I still, I'm not sharing the name of it just yet, but but, uh, just a little suspense. Dun, 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 suspense. But um, yeah, so the short, so it is a freemium in the sense I could charge for it and won't just because I want it to be free for readers to have a sense of what my writing style is like and for them to also have a sense of basically kind of the tone of what this series will be because this short story does set the tone for it. Um, so I'm excited to see how that will do, just getting the short out there into the hands of, uh, the eyes, I should say, of readers, getting their feedback on that, um, the episodic story, and then just really ramping up, focusing my energy on list building and continuing to grow my list rather than social media. Social is awesome, and I do believe that I will still keep a type of presence on social just because there are so many readers that are like just super attached, but my focus is my list. Like that's where I share all of the details and all the juicy goods, that kind of thing. So what about you? We are kicking off this new year. What will you be focusing on as far as like marketing strategies? Oh, all the things. Well, I'm really excited about marketing because I have a new strategy that I'm trying this year. And so it'll be really cool to see how it turns out. Uh, Last year, Amazon expanded their pre-order capabilities. So instead of only being able to set up a pre-order for three months ahead of time, you can do an entire year. So I went ahead and put an entire series up for pre-order. And it's really interesting to see the pre-orders come in. I think it's helpful that readers know that the entire series will be out in 2020 this wonderful year. And so they can go ahead and pre-order the entire thing. And I'm really targeting my fans, fans that I already have, not necessarily new readers, because this trilogy is at a higher price point and it will be full price. I probably won't have um, discounts, if any, on the books. Like the discount is during the pre-order period and that's it. And so I'm really hoping that that will uh, help the the hardcore fans and really kind of encouraging them to support me through writing. And then the marketing strategies that I'm really excited about trying out is I have had a, for the last like six months of 2019, I had a really big focus on platform building and I started doing video newsletters, which it honestly is just a video that I'm recording, just talking about stuff. It's no more than 10 minutes, but I'm finding that readers absolutely love that. So I want to wrap it up and maybe do Um, up to two a month to really get that engagement going on and really encourage people to, you know, come across. I think they really like that personal feeling when they see me talking. And it's a lot different from 
just writing or just like reading my newsletters or reading my books to see me talk about things and get excited about them is just a lot different for the reader. So I'm really excited about engaging them that way. I think that's really what's going to be a number one important thing in 2020 is really focusing on engaging your readers and building your author platforms up. So that's the goal. Yeah, I think that's pretty genius just because video is it now. Like all of this, oh, well, you know, go out and write a 1,500, 2,000 word blog post and, you know, pitch blogs. I mean, sure, if you want to get posted on like the Huffington Post and Forbes, that kind of thing, absolutely. But like when it comes to, you know, just engaging readers and growing your audience, video is where it's at. I mean, like YouTube is now king. (laughs) You know, YouTube is king in any other type of video format. You know, TikTok is growing with the kids nowadays. So TikTok and all these different video platforms. Kind of wish Vine would come back. You know, do it for the Vine. But (laughs) 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 Um, I think that's super awesome. Can't wait to hear about all the things. But it's awesome that we're sharing all these marketing strategies because today's episode we are interviewing a phenomenal bestseller i'm sure you've probably heard of her her name is almost everywhere (laughs) elise kova she is a writing i would say a writing queen so to speak in our indie space Um, we just respect her we absolutely love her she's awesome and she dives deep into her own marketing strategies as both a indie author but ho spoiler alert she's also a trad author she's a hybrid so it's gonna be really cool diving into those strategies i'm really excited for this episode and we hope you guys really enjoy it welcome to the indie author lifestyle show on this week's episode we have a very special guest let me introduce elise kova she is the usa today best-selling author of fantasy stories filled with magic and romance in a pack her past lives she has graduated from an mba program lived in japan for a bit and worked for a fortune 500 technology company However, she finds herself much happier in her current reincarnation as a full-time author. When not writing, she can usually be found playing video games, drawing, watching anime, or talking with readers on social media. She's happy to call St. Petersburg, Florida her home, but is always looking forward to her next trip. Welcome, Elise. We're so excited that you're here. Uh, We'd love to just tell us a little bit about why you decided to become an indie author. So I it kind of happened. It wasn't so much of a decision, but it just, the decision was made for me. So I, when I was living in Japan, I, I joke, I got bored and wrote five books, but I was always, I was always a huge fan of fan fiction. And I was really into Marvel's um, Loki at that time where Tom Hiddleston was the only, only man in existence to me. (laughs) Um, And so I, I wanted to write Thor fan fiction, but I knew myself and I was like, I'm going to write a hundred thousand words of fan fiction and hate myself that I didn't, you know, make it my own story. So using that as like my inspiration springboard of just, I want to write a story about a sexy dark haired man. (laughs) I was like, all right, let's go from there. Um, And that was kind of how Air Awakens was born. But because I came at it from that fan fiction sort of perspective, I published a chapter each day on fiction press. And I got a bunch of readers who were following me and they were awesome. And when I finished the series, they were like, okay, what's next? When are you publishing this? And so I started looking into publication. I queried 111 agents. They all rejected me. Um, And then I said, well, you know, I have no stigma against independent publishing. Um, I see it as a viable avenue going forward. So I started to do that and Air Awakens was released in 2015 and I just released the, um, oh goodness, what is it? 12th book in that world and my 22nd overall published novel last month. So wow. it's been congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. Oh my goodness. First of all, the fact that you said over a hundred rejections, I thought jk rowling had the crown at you know 27 i mean no disrespect you know what i mean like no shame yeah. or anything like that but but that's like first of all major respect hats off because how many writers would quit you know at like the 50th at like the 50th rejection and be like you know 
I don't think this is for me. Like I've reached 50 rejections and nobody wants it, you know? So like, that is absolutely amazing. And so you wanted to, okay. So basically Air Awakens was birthed from like a heart of fan fiction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was that was the original impetus of I want to write something. But then I but then I was like, okay, slow down, just chill for a second. Let's think about what exactly you want to write beyond just you know sexy dark haired men. <laughs> no, absolutely. First of all, I have read Air Awakens. Absolutely loved it. Um, the fact that she yeah. is a girl who's basically raised in a library and then she like goes and does her own thing. Yes. <laughs> All the yes, but I, I genuinely loved it and um, just, you know, the character of the Dark Prince, so to speak, um, and his development. But how did, um, besides it being, um, you know, like fan fiction, right? Like, how did that story, how did that world come into being? You know, it's it's very unique. Um, oh, thank me, you. Different. And, I, you know, I do love ele elemental magic and all of that. And, and also just how, you know, like, how, how there's a focus on like history and like also like developing that you know that magic and that craft so how did that even come into being because it is a very intricate and unique world so I've I grew up reading fantasy I've always loved fantasy it's been my jam in movies tv shows books my whole life um and I love that element of the world building aspect so as soon as I said okay I'm not going to write a fan fiction I want to write my own thing that was when I started thinking about well what does my own thing look like and you have to start making those choices as an author elemental magic really came about because I wanted something that would be simple relatively speaking for readers to pick up in the sense of I didn't want a magic system that was so complex that readers would look at it and they would feel daunted by it or feel like they had to flip to the glossary in the back to read it. I do like magic systems like that. And I have written magic systems like that as well. But when I was kind of approaching it, I was like, I don't, I don't really want to do that just starting out. So I... I picked elemental magic for that reason specifically. It, you can say this person has fire powers, this person has air powers, and everyone kind of knows what's going on. But I did want to deepen it as the series went on because I had all of these other ideas for complexities and ways to make it my own and more than just this person can throw fire from their hands and, and add layers to it. So I really wanted to start at a very simple place and then take readers kind of on that journey to somewhere more in depth. Um, and Vala, the main character, having air magic honestly happened just because I wanted an homage to the Zelda games. And one of my favorite games is Wind Waker. And if you add an L, it becomes Wind Walker. <laughs> That is, awesome. that is entirely how it was born. It's like, it's like everyone is like, oh, you watched Avatar The Last Airbender and loved it. And I'm like, actually, I didn't have, I watched Avatar The Last Airbender for the first time in the past like three years. No way. Uh-huh. Um, I am just now watching oh. Legend of Korra for the first time after I finished, I, I just finished the sequel series and I just finished the first season of Korra because my friends are like, you can't keep watching it until you finish the sequel series. Mind blown. So I've, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone thinks it's like, oh, you loved Avatar. And I'm like, no, I just wanted a simple magic system and really liked Zelda. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. First of all, wow. Um, that just shows how creative we can be as authors because right? um, I would assume that every author who writes elemental magic at some point in their childhood, binge watched Nickelodeon and like consumed every episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, like I did. Uh, <laughs> I was a huge Avatar fan, which is why I loved it so much. And which is why I tend to love Elemental Magic so much, just because I'm like, it's so stinking cool. And of course I knew about it. Like I grew up during that age. So I, I caught maybe an episode or two, but I just, Avatar la never really clicked with me. Ooh. So it was never something that I, that I watched. I know it's an unpopular opinion please don't hate me <laughs> but uh, it just it never clicked with me and so it was one of those things that yeah I knew it existed but I I didn't know beyond like that intro and then the fire nation attacked like <laughs> that was it that was like my knowledge of avatar <laughs> I mean that is like literally the entire premise of this yeah. story. here comes the avatar fire nation attacks they fight for like a trillion episodes <laughs> <laughs> no, super super cool and I love how you took that approach where you said okay I'm going to take something simple and I'm going to build on it and I'm going to develop this incredibly intricate magic system which is super awesome and you nailed it especially you know like for young adult readers 
<laughs> definitely nailed it for sure. Yeah, that's really cool. I must admit, I've never seen Airbender Avatar series at all. So you I'm also really behind on things. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> True confession. It's okay. I, I had it either, like I said, three years ago, I watched it. I finally watched it with my friends and I didn't love it as much as they wanted me to. And I think oh, I well. broke their hearts. <laughs> It happens. It happens. It's like a nostalgia thing. That's what I'm hearing. Right? Like it's really right? a nostalgia thing. But yeah, so you've released a 12th book in this series, which mm. is amazing. That's awesome. Um, did you have an ideal of like your series ahead of time? Did you know how many books you were going to write or did it just kind of come together as you were writing? So a, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, um, and just just for clarity, so it's the 12th book in the world, but you can start with any of the first books. So there's the original five book trilogy, or five, five book trilogy, that's how trilogies work. There's the original five book series of Air Awakens, and then there's the Golden Guard trilogy, that's where the trilogy comes in, um, which takes place earlier in the timeline, and then there's Vortex Chronicles, which kind of takes place later in the timeline. And so it's you can start with any of the first books the crown's dog air awakens or vortex visions and i really stress that because and i can't exactly say why without spoil spoilers but you get a different reading experience depending on where you start in the series and each reading experience is valid um to answer your question as far as how, if i knew how many books when I was writing Air Awakens, I had no idea because I was I was baby author playing around online and I, I didn't have a sense for how many books would be in a series. I did, however, know the greater story of the world. So the other two series that I wrote didn't kind of come out of nowhere, didn't wasn't one of those things that Air Awakens did really well. And I said, oh, how can I tack on another series to this? It was very conscious. And the way that the, the three series weave together hopefully that becomes apparent. Um, so I knew I wanted to write more. I knew what stories I wanted to write, but I didn't know how many books they would be or when I would write them or anything like that. So a, a little bit of, of knowing and a little bit of how it happened. Yeah, technical question for me then. So like, because I tend to be that way where I think all three of us on this, <laughs> um, on this interview, actually, we have like a grand scope of the world and then we kind of just chop it up as we go like okay it's gonna be x amount of books x amount of characters and so on right um so for you know i know you said that you had the stories that you knew you wanted to write but how did you come to that conclusion of okay five books in this series we're gonna do a trilogy over here um or like you know what i mean it, yeah it that you were conscious about it, it wasn't like a oh I got to book three, you know what, let me write three more, you know, because like when you even reading, for example, <clears throat> and I love her. So like, this is no knock to Cassandra Clare. Um, she is the reason why I started writing YA fantasy. Okay, so like no <laughs> knock to her. But um, when even in middle school, when I started the Mortal Instruments series, I got to the end of book three. And you can tell that there is a clear end to the trilogy but then there's three books added to it and it becomes the six book series rather than the original trilogy right so it's kind of this thing where I feel like Cassandra at a point reached you know she got to that place in the story and she said oh I can actually keep going from here and it still is a logical timeline it still makes yeah. sense um whereas other authors you know if they do that you as a reader you can tell they completely botched the series they just wanted to extend it for the sake of saying I have five books yeah <laughs> no shade no tea um, so, <laughs> oh um being conscious with what with your decisions for your series how did you go about saying okay we're gonna stop at five for the initial series but we're gonna make this next one three on it so on and so yeah so air awakens that that one like i said that just happened that was a i wrote it and i was done when i was done and then the original Air Awakens that was published on Fiction Press was actually just shy of a, of a million words. It was like 980,000 words between all the five books. Oh. And so I cut like 450,000 words from it. Um, oh. So that went, that went through a lot of editorial, but it still remained five books because um, the arcs were sort of already there. The Golden Guard trilogy, that one worked out because I... It, it tells the story of how this illustrious fighting force, the Golden Guard, was formed and how these six people came together. And I knew I wanted to write split points of view. And so mm -hmm. 
I did two points of view per book. And then mm. each of the two characters had a very clear story arc. So that series I also mentioned to people, they're kind of more three standalones than three continuous stories. Um, or one continuous story, rather. And then as far as Vortex Chronicles, which is my latest series in the world, that one that one is a little bit more of a now that I've been writing a lot longer and I've written a lot more books and kind of have a feeling of, and and I hate to say that because it sounds so unhelpful to like authors who are just starting out of like, I just have a feeling of how many books it's going to be. <laughs> But I really, I really do because it, it is that I start to outline, I start to look at the series, I start to think of here's the greater plot arc, now here are the smaller missions to complete that plot arc, and then each book needs their own complete plot arc, and then you go, okay, that's how many books I need. Um, the, the only thing about Vortex Chronicles is that I didn't know if it would be four or five books, and I really didn't know that until I finished book three, got started on book four, that I really went okay, yeah, this needs to be five books. Um, and so that that variant I'll usually have on a series where I'm like, I think it's going to be this many, but maybe it'll be one less or one more. Um, and, and that'll be variable until I usually get about halfway through the series and then kind of see where I'm at. Mm, really cool. That's a really cool way of uh, breaking it down. And I know what you mean when you're saying like you kind of get a feeling for it because I finally have gotten to that point where I'm getting a feeling for it. And I'm like, okay, this one is going to be a trilogy. This one's going to be my long series. And oh gosh, I'm not good at like long series with tons and tons of books. I just get so tired of my characters that I want to go do something else that's new and fresh and just kind of like pop into other characters' heads. And so I know you've written some, so I know there's the whole Air Awakens world that you've written, but then you've also written some other stuff. And I remember the first time I actually heard about you was because one of my sisters had brought home a library book and it was your book and she was reading it and she was like, yeah, it's really good. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I, I picked it up. It was The Alchemist of Loom. I think that's how you say it. The yeah, um, Alchemist of Loom. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So that one is really different. I think you kind of call that one your your dark, more dark fantasy. Yeah, I, I joke that one's my dark baby because that one, that one was the one. So it's it's an it's shelved as an adult fantasy, and I always I always feel the need to clarify adult being not erotica, but for adults. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, I know what it, you mean. Yeah, I figure most people do, but I'm always like, I always have that person at like a convention where I'm like, oh, and this one's adult, and then I'm like, oh, so there's a lot of sex in it, and I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's it's definitely it's my adult fantasy, and it has YA sensibilities. I say I wrote it like with YA esque pacing, where sometimes you you sit with adult fantasy novels, and and they are very like well, it's going to take me 200 pages to meet all of the main cast and know anything that's happening. Um, and I did try to avoid that, but it is very throw you into the circumstances. I'm not, I'm not holding readers' hands through it. There's no moment where the main character reflects on, I was just a normal 16-year-old girl until I found out that the Fire Nation attacked and then... <laughs> <laughs> so I there no moments like that no like I didn't want any awkward dialogue where you know the character was going do you remember that time when we went to the park to practice your magic and this is how your magic worked whereas if that was real life you know that character would be like are you having a stroke are you okay <laughs> so so that one is it's a completely different world and it's a completely different writing and approach to writing where air awakens i say is like my popcorn fantasy where it's just the it's simple to digest and you just like okay one more chapter one more page let me keep going it doesn't require a ton of thought or a ton of investment and i really wanted to write that that big epic fantasy that i loved reading and that was kind of the loom saga for me which is completed at three books so i could have called it a trilogy but that was another one where i'm like i don't know if this is three books or four books <laughs> yeah that's awesome um with the with the marketing your books, how did you decide to approach it? Like I know authors, a big topic with indie authors and a lot of things that they struggle with is marketing. So yeah. when you first started out, I know you had, you know, your series on fiction press, but how mm -hmm. did you approach marketing? How did you determine where to get started and what would be effective? Well, I mean, step one of marketing is get a corkscrew. Step two is a bottle of wine. 
<laughs> Step three, the glass is optional. You can take it right to the head. <laughs> um, once you have that down, I, uh, <laughs> so I, I, do, I do have a background in business and that was one thing that really helped me as an independent author um, because I approached it like a business and I approached it as I am starting a company. I am an entrepreneur. Um, I'm starting a small business and my focus in my MBA was actually on marketing and international business. So I kind of leveraged that marketing side of my brain and I really focused on, I need to write and develop a marketing plan. And the first step of a marketing plan is market research. And so I looked at a lot of what was happening in the industry and I tried to mix that with my sensibilities from my day job at the time, which was managing social media for a large company. And so it was sort of that combination of looking and seeing what publishers were doing and authors were doing, as well as the best practices that I had learned and picked up along the way and sort of developing that marketing plan and, and doing a lot of marketing where, you know, I think, I think one of the things that really helped Air Awakens launch was it had a long tail promo, which I don't think a lot of independent authors do, but I had, I mean, I had physical arcs that I sent out to reviewers, not many because that's expensive and I was just getting started. Um, but I had physical arcs that I sent out. I had my cover reveal a couple months before, you know, the book was out. I was talking about it on social media for a couple months before the pre-order was up. And so I, I think a lot of that, those sorts of approaches really kind of helped prime things for success. But I do emphasize prime things for success because there was an element of luck to Air Awakens. And I mean, I, I, I'll take credit where I can in, you know, I hit right tropes, right book, right time. I did those th steps or to help it, but it was the right book, right time. And, and it, it took off and I'm really lucky, but that is one thing that's frustrating even for me, because after you have a series that does really well, you look at all your other series and you're like, come on other children. Why are you not like my star child over here? Why are you not doing this? I'm doing everything for you that I did for them. And you're just sitting there like a bump on a log. Um, and so, so that is one thing that I do want to say to authors too, is that sometimes, a lot of times there is just an element of luck to it that is frustrating, but you can do all of those other things that are in your control. So that way, if when luck happens, you have all of your ducks in a row and you're ready to just make the most of that luck. Such sage advice. Um, and I'm really, you know, I appreciate you hitting on the fact that, you know, there is an element of luck <laughs> because, you know, there are authors out there that are like, well, I'm on my seventh and that hasn't happened yet. I'm out here grinding <laughs> yeah. and then it's not taking off. And so I think that I would say, what would be your best advice, right? For that author who is like, okay, Elise, you know, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I've been writing, I've been trying to do all the things. What should I focus on? Um, what can I nail now that will really set me up for success? You know, I love the fact that you brought up that you, you looked at it from jump as a business and so and I think that I mean yeah there's an air of luck but that also kind of put you um several steps ahead just because many authors don't view it as a business they view it as a hobby that they're trying to turn into something that's professional in the career and you know they kind of start late in the game you know and so that that sets them back a bit and so what would you say would be the first things that they should start on um to go ahead and start getting them like ready to soar so to speak so you, you're saying like an author who does have like a handful of books published maybe, and they're mm -hmm. just kind of, they're not finding traction. Okay. I would, I would say, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is define what success is to you. And this is another thing that I talk about a lot with authors where I see a lot of authors looking for success in other people. Like, mm. oh, this author has this, or oh, this author does that. And they're trying to imitate that mm. without first finding from within what they want out of publishing because you, you mentioned the hobby and that's one thing that like I feel like a lot of authors will will turn up their nose at authors who just want to publish as a hobby and there's nothing wrong with that but mm -hmm. the the thing is is if you're approaching it like a hobby and you want returns like a business you have a disconnect as an author between what you want or how you're approaching it and what you want and yes, and there's 
and it doesn't line up. So I would say the first thing is really sit down with yourself and figure out what you want to get out of it. And then the next thing that I would say is once you have that defined, that's going to be kind of your, your compass, your guiding star. And then the next thing that I would do from there is I would look at the books you've already published and detach yourself as much as possible from them and say, why isn't this working? And be brutally honest, because if the fact is you were just starting out and you didn't have money for an editor and they have crap editing, then that's a reason. If you were just starting out and you didn't have money for a cover designer, that's a reason. If you wrote really complex, tricky books that don't fit neatly into a genre and people land on your product page and they don't know who it's for, they don't know if it's for them or not, that's a problem. And some of those problems you can fix. Some of those problems, if you identify, oh, my cover, I wrote a paranormal romance that does hit the tropes, but it, the cover doesn't say paranormal romance, you can recover it. Recover it. And, and if you can take steps to fix those past errors, take steps to fix them. But I do think there is a certain point at which authors have to kind of cut their losses and say, I made the choices I made. I've noted what I did wrong and what I did right, and I need to move forward now. I need to figure out what's next because I think while it is important to pay attention to your backlist, it's also important to think, you know, if it's going to take a lot of time, effort, and energy to quote unquote fix something, it may not be worth it. Look, look to writing the next sensible book and I say sensible as in like what will fit the market and what'll fit your genre. And then as you develop a following, your backlist is going to have natural sell through by people who love what you write. And they're going to look at your weird baby over here that you're just like, I don't know what this is. I don't know if it's a lit RPG or a reverse harem, but it's fun. And those are the people that are going to go, yeah, it is fun. I'll read that. And so it may never be a big seller, but you're going to have a series that's going to act as that top of your funnel. That's going to funnel people to your backlist. I absolutely love that advice. That's so great because I just feel like sometimes if an author is just like a hobby author, they get looked down on. Or if they're an author that's really focused on the career and they're writing to market, that's mm -hmm. also something that's kind of like frowned upon that whole like write to market world word. Uh, is that something that you tend to do with your books? Do you tend to write something that you know specifically the market is going to like or how do you really balance you know something that you're passionate and excited about between knowing that hey this is also my business and I need to make money so I'm going to write something that readers love. i am mostly been directed by what I want to write. I should be better about writing to market and I try to be but I do I do really believe that it needs to be a merger. Because I, I look at Loom, for example, and Loom didn't do as well as Air Awakens, and I can point to a number of reasons of why it didn't. It was, I went from simple YA fantasy to adult complex fantasy, and that, that's one thing. The other thing about Loom is it, it sits on the corner of a bunch of genres. It's an epic fantasy, but it's also gas lamp, so it has steampunk elements. There are dragons reimagined, but they're not dragons that people think. Like It's just all of these things and factors to it that, that make it not a clear book when it's not, it doesn't have a clear reader. Um, and so I, I think I've tried to find a little bit of both where I don't want to write a book that I'm not passionate about because I think readers know when you're not passionate about a book and they're going to pick it up and they're just, they're not going to feel it because you didn't feel it. Um, at the same time, if I do try looking forward when I have a series idea, I do try to at least consider the market because I, this is a business for me and it is a product that I'm putting out where if I can't say this is the reader who's going to buy this and I don't have a customer profile of who that person is, what they like, what the other books are that they like, then I need to figure out how to modify my idea to, to find that person. And maybe it isn't the hottest trend. I usually don't write to market as far as trends and stuff go just because I wrote long books and it takes a while to write them and get them out there. And I can't go any faster than what I am. And in fact, now that we have year long pre-orders, I'm trying to slow down a bit. Um, but I, I don't write to trend, but I do try to be conscious of if you don't know who the person is that you're buying their book, you can't advertise or your advertising isn't as good. You can't communicate it through cover and, and all of that has to be aligned. So a, a little bit of both, I would say. 
And I love that you touched upon that. And just for, you know, the listeners that are like, okay, Elise, what does that look like? So would you walk us through that process of, okay, you know, when you begin, because I feel like there, there's a sense of knowing the market even before that idea really gets to like be set in stone in the brain, so to speak. And so could you walk us through that process of how you go about, you know, doing your market research and then fusing that and tailoring that to the idea that you're actually going to write so that you can bring what this market wants to them and you know you write something you enjoy but it's also incredibly profitable so the way that i try to do it is number one read 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 um read books that are doing well in in your genres in the market that you're that you're trying to sell in um and and look, look for commonalities between them. One thing that I did a while back and, and I actually want to do it again is, and I didn't do it for just indies. I did it for trad and indie books that were really big sellers. And I actually outlined the books, um, as I read them. So I said, chapter one, these things happen. Chapter two, these things happen. And I looked for similarities between them. So I found, you know, the the love interest was introduced in the first four chapters of the ultimate love interest was usually introduced in the first four chapters. And, and those kind of commonalities that maybe readers aren't consciously looking for, but they've been subconsciously trained to read that way and to look for those things when reading. Um, so I do that. I also, I also just, you know, look for, look at what is selling. Now, as far as when I have an idea, cause I'm actually in that stage now where I'm reading a bunch and working on the next idea that I have, I will, I will kind of, I'll get that idea sort of half baked of this is the story I want to tell. This is the world it's in. You know, I, I may have some gray areas or unknowns here and there, but, but I have a pretty clear vision of what it is. And at that point, that's when I'll start to look at what are people gravitating towards and what of that can fit neatly into my story organically. Um, And so I'll use something as an example where academies, academies were just really big. I mean, they're still kind of big, but I think we're on the tail end of that trend personally. But academy is a setting. That's just a place that a story, and there are check boxes for the trope. I'm, I'm sure there are, and I don't know them because I haven't read a ton of academies, but I mean, I would guess something like you probably have, you know, an upperclassman love interest, I'm guessing. You probably have like the, the teacher who's the nice one and the teacher who's the mean one. So, so you know, we're checking back boxes here, but those are just archetypes and settings that you can really fit a lot of stories into. Um, And so I look for those. Now there are of course trends and stuff that are more specific. Like if you're not writing a reverse harem, there is no way to fit a reverse harem into any narrative. But if you do want to write a reverse harem, conversely, if that's the book you want to write, you can fit almost any narrative around a reverse harem. It just has to be a reverse harem. So, So I think it is that getting your story to that point where you kind of know what the essence of the story is and then seeing if there's anything in the market that you want to incorporate. But again, I I do caution people where unless you are someone who can publish quickly and really capitalize on a trend, um, I, I do caution people against trying too hard for that because I always, I mean, that's what trends are. They, they rise, they fall, they're fast. Um, and, the cream of the crop will stick around for sure, but all of the books that that you know people wrote to capitalize, they make their money on. And as you said, like no shade, no no problem with that. Make your money, have a great day. Um, but if that's not your business model, don't try to make it your business model. Totally agree with that. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. And I like how you focus on the reading aspect and learning from reading. And I like how you have a system for digging into it and kind of looking at the similarities between different books. Uh, I realize that it's something that I've always done unconsciously when I'm reading is kind of like picking things out and applying them. And now that I go back and I like reread some of my books and I look at what I was reading at the time, I was like, oh, I was like following this kind of like trend right here or this theme Mm -hmm. in the story. And it's really cool. And I think the readers do pick up on that 
uh, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, but it's just the kind of story that they enjoy. And so I like that idea of really combining both your passion, but then like being aware of what's going on in the market and not just kind of like closing yourself down, but being out there and reading and making yourself aware. And I think that education is a huge part of any kind of business. And so as a career author, that's something we need to do is continue to uh, educate ourselves on what's going on and what's trending and what the outlook is for the next year so that we can be prepared to sell our books and do a better job. But yeah, that's, that's really exciting. And I know that you are doing something new this year, which is coaching for authors. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I was invited to join this site called Coach the World and it's just coachtheworld.com. And if you want to see my specific profile, you can go to coachtheworld.com forward slash Elise Kova. It's just my name altogether. Um, and it is something that I, I was debating for a while because I... I love helping people, but it's also, I have to have time to do other things as well. So I was like, how do I, how do I make this work? Um, But I, but I do really like it because it does give me an opportunity where if someone comes to me with a question and I can give them a one-off answer, I'm happy to give them a quick one-off answer. But I I definitely will have people who come to me with these really in-depth questions. And I'm like, I want to give you the time you need, but that's going to be like an hour. (laughs) So let's, let's figure this out. And Coach the World is this really cool website where you can book time with me. Um, I have 15, 45, and I think hour are the three time slots that I have. Maybe it's 15, 30 in an hour, something, something like that. Um, and uh, you, anyone, anyone can book it. So even just like someone who read my books could book 15 minutes with me and just be like, can I talk about Air Awakens with you? <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's okay. Um, but I, I do gear it toward, you know, it's any it's any kind of writer at any point in their career um, who has questions, whether they're about craft or whether they're about marketing or whether they're about business. And um, I try to be really transparent and honest. And if I, if someone comes to me with a question that they're like, this is my really specific question. And I look at it and I'm like, Hey man, I don't think I'm going to be of help to you. Like I'm happy to, you know, before you pay me any money, let me just tell you, I don't, think that it's going to be helpful to you at all to talk to me. Um, but it, it, it has been something that's been really fun. And I've gotten, I've had the opportunity to speak with a few authors so far and it's been, it's been pretty cool. Oh, that's really awesome. And I love that idea because uh, when I was first starting out, one of the first things that I did was I booked a call with the coach because I was like, I need help. Like I know about marketing and stuff, but I have, again, I have a business background. So it's more technical business stuff, but I really wanted to talk to someone who knew what they were doing with books. And so that's awesome that, that you offer that. And we'll definitely include that link in the show notes. So our listeners have an easy way of finding it and can book time with you in chat. But yeah, that's, that's amazing. Oh, thanks. It, like I said, it's been a ton of fun and that's, if it's not fun, why do it? <laughs> exactly. And I'm a huge fan too, of having those multiple sources of income um, yes. as an author life. So that gives you something else to add to it. And that's, and that's one of my big things. And, and this year has been really diversification of income as much as possible, because I think a lot of authors saw it when Amazon allegedly, suspiciously, probably redid their algorithm in August where, you know, all of a sudden books were selling great. And then we're like, wait, what happened? And why are none of my AMS ads working? And why am I making half of what I was making before? Um, and and that that's very real. And especially if you're in KU, you know, you you follow the rules, but there's always that fear in the back of my mind whispering of if Amazon decides they're not friendly with you anymore, they can just take it all away. And so I, I do think it's really important for authors as much as possible to diversify their revenue streams because that's just going to make you more secure long-term. Yeah. Amen to that. Like I definitely agree with that. And then also you have your website and so you're building up your author platform and then you also have swag for your readers, which you have a really cool swag site. I love that. <laughs> what inspired you to create that? Honestly, it was just, it was a lot of readers asking, do you sell this? Do you have that? Um, And I I started partnering with 
small stores and small shops um, to get products out there. So I have a Society6 store. That's my low, like, that's my easy way where I can just upload something and be like, if you want it on a t-shirt, you can get it on a t-shirt. But I, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of small creators and that's been, that's been really exciting. And, and really one of the big things for it for me was I, I wanted to use it as an opportunity to prompt discussions regarding intellectual property and intellectual property use um, by fans mm -hmm. and by people who are making items for profit and, and hopefully create an inform, create a dialogue and inform in at least my goal in a way that didn't feel attacking to anyone or anything, but was more of a, I want to create an avenue where creators can easily license things from me they can get the stamp of approval that it's officially licensed merchandise. I've given the okay. I'm going to help promote it. And, and they know that then buyers know they're supporting the author, that the author's given the thumbs up. And, you know, they can, they can know too that they're not doing anything that skirts the lines of legality, however small. So that was, that was another big, big motivator for me on it. Yeah, that that's awesome. And that's actually something I did not know until I think it was last year. I wasn't sure about I, I didn't know about the extended license and whether or not I could actually use all my covers for merchandise. So that's a really good point to bring up. Um, I have a lot of some covers are custom illustrated, so no problems there. And I have all the rights and I can make that yeah. into merchandise. But others I know are just, you know, they're they're full of stock and I don't have the rights to use those images as merchandise. So that's kind of something else that I can't use and something to consider moving forward. Um, or, you know, if I want to work with that designer to get the license for turning that into merchandise. Yeah. And it, and it works both ways too, where it's a lot of authors because intellectual property law is complex. There are reasons why people go to really expensive colleges for four years to learn about it. And, and, a lot of authors don't even understand, you know, whether it's whether it's stock photos and how to make sure they have the right licenses or whether it's their own intellectual property that they create, how to defend it and what's okay and what's not okay. And and I don't think anyone, author or fan who's creating merchandise or fan who's creating fan art or anything, like I don't think anyone is out there or at least not 99% of people. <laughs> I, I think most of us are out there trying to do the right thing and not trying to be shady. But, you know, we don't know. And there isn't that discussion about intellectual property. So that is one thing with my merchandise that I that I've hopefully have, am starting to create a space for discussion on and awareness. And I don't know, we'll see if it works. <laughs> if nothing else, it's fun for my readers. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fantastic shop. Like I was in there and I was like, oh, I want to order all the things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That is really awesome. But um, I do have a craft question. And so yeah. when it comes to like writing the stories out, right, um, I love listening to authors in their process um, just because I tend to focus on um, the craft side and I go to Angela for all things marketing. And so... <laughs> And so when it comes to craft and, you know, like developing the story, right, you know, how do you go, like, what is kind of like the overview, because it can get really deep, but what is the overview of your process when it comes to your characters, when it comes to your setting, and also having that conscious knowing of, okay, this is what is technically expected in this genre, but mm -hmm. I'm, this is how I'm going to put my own twist on it, regardless of what readers would subconsciously expect. Like what's your process when it goes when it comes to building your stories? So I, I think my initial process is and, and I usually say my world building takes anywhere between six months to three years. Like I've had story ideas that I've just been sitting on and jotting down notes and whatnot and then putting Same. it off to the side. <laughs> um yeah, and, and I think that's normal, right? Um so so that part of the process where it's just sort of the ideation phase and I'm starting to build out the world and think about it and like, oh, it'd be really cool if someone could do this. It, it's very much brainstorming in the true sense of there's no wrong answers and I just put everything on the page and I get it all down and I, I see what what sticks. And then once I, once I have a bunch there and I start to have a clearer image, that's when I start to sit down and I start to look at all of this random stuff and I'm like, okay, what works together what doesn't work together 
And pretty much throughout that phase, there's the subconscious, I'm reading books and I'm taking in media and my subconscious is playing back there in ways that I'm not aware of. But it, it, there's no effort on my part throughout that portion to say, this is what readers expect, or this is what the genre is doing, or this is what the tropes are, because I do want it to feel like my story foremost, and and not to you know flip the bird and say screw all to the readers, but more of a, I want it to I want to look at it and know that it was mine, and it wasn't just how what amalgamation of tropes can I make, so I usually get it to that stage where, the world is pretty clear in my head. I have probably the main character, main like core cast pretty clear in my head. And that's when I start thinking about things as you were saying of, okay, is there anything that I do want to incorporate? Like, do I want to set it in an academy or do I, do I want to have elves or some kind of hot pointy ear dude? Um, is that just important to me on a personal level? <laughs> All important questions to ask. Um, and then I start, I start wrapping those in and usually at that point, as I'm firming things up, that's when I really start making the timeline and I really start working on the story arcs. And one of the, one of the big things that I believe in and that I love is there's a token quote and I'm going to butcher it, but it's like the story begins at the fall. Mm. Um, and I, I, I butchered it, but it's, to that effect. And and what the core of the quote is basically saying is he was referencing it in a letter to his editor about the Similarian and trying to push for the Similarian to be released at the same time as Lord of the Rings, because his argument was Lord of the Rings makes more sense when you understand that it was that world was created because of the fall of the elves. Mm -hmm. And so be, every story begins because of a fall. Every story begins because of history. And that's a big thing for me where I really try in that early world building phase to think of the world on a very macro level and look at all those major events in history that affected the world state now um, and how we got to where the story is starting. And that's what I'm a total nerd for. <laughs> Speaking my language, I literally do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I do the exact same thing I think to myself because as I'm writing the current story, my brain, I can literally visibly see what happened before that is the cause of what is going on now. And so it's like, okay, this is what's taking place because they're recovering from this or they're trying to restore this or they're trying to build mm -hmm. something new from this, you know? And so I, kindred spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! And that's actually, that's how my Loom Saga got started because I was building out this world and I had this story idea and I outlined it all. And then I went, this is basically a prequel because I wanted to see what happened where, what happens when a hero goes on the hero's journey and fails? Mm. then what happens to that hero and that mm. was how the alchemist of loom got started because i had this story that was the hero's journey but then something in my brain was like well what if she didn't succeed what if the mission was to go defeat the evil king and she didn't defeat the evil king and everyone she loved died and that's the main character of the loom saga <laughs> no i love that you pointed that out because that happens to me too so i wrote an entire <laughs> i wrote most of a novel and then I realized oh you wrote a series that is like way before what you're actually supposed to be right like like I wrote the before before you know and then I realized oh okay well this is great knowledge to know because now I know what I need to do <laughs> and, and you have a good newsletter magnet for fans of that series <laughs> No, for sure. But I think one of my questions for you as well is, you know, you, you have Air Awakens, you have the Loom Saga, you have the Vortex that you're in right now, but what is coming up for you? Like, what is next in the world of Kova? No spoilers, of course, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, so I do have... I do have a series right now that I don't know what's going to happen with it. My agent mm -hmm. has it in her hands. Um, so if, if, a, if a house picks it up, it'll go that route. All I can really, that I've really said about it and that I can really say is that it's vampires versus witches. Um, so that's it on that one. But I, if, if a house doesn't pick it up or if I can't land on a deal with a house, um, it will probably be out sometime in the next six to 
18 months. I don't mm-hmm. know exactly when because everything is in so flux and traditional publishing isn't the fastest process. Um, but so I do have that. And then I have another series that I just started thinking about um, that is set also in the Air Awakens world, um, very similar to the others in that it it would be its own, you know, you can start there without having read any of the other Air Awakens books and perhaps even more so because um, the Air Awakens Vortex Chronicles, the main character is the daughter of the main character from the original series, whereas this would be totally a new storyline, new departure, new kind of corner of the world because Vortex Chronicles really expands the world. So I have something there um, that I am thinking about, but right now I'm actually... For the next two or three months, I've kind of made a commitment to myself where I'm just going to read and I'm going to write what I want to write and I'm going to not write to any deadline because I've been doing that now for five, six years straight Mm. and I am creatively exhausted by that and I want to take a couple months where I'm going to write but it's going to be purely for passion and then if that turns into a project that I later sell, awesome. If it doesn't, cool. So I'll probably have a clearer idea of what's next come February, March timeframe about when the final book in Vortex Chronicles is out. But for the time (laughs) being, I'm just kind of like, I'm writing whatever my muse tells me and not stressing as much as I can. (laughs) That is so cool. And I just have one more question because you hinted at it and I'm like, I gotta know. What, how is it balancing, um, what I would call the hybrid author, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you're leaning towards indie, but you could also go, you know, trad if you get picked up. Like, what is that balance like? You know, because I know sometimes the two worlds can be at war. <laughs> you know, indie versus trad. Like, no, why would you go trad? That is ridiculous. Like, you know, and then in, you know, whereas with trad, like, no, why would you go indie? Like, no, you need someone behind you. Blah, blah, blah. You know, so like, how do you, I guess, tiptoe the balance between the two? Yeah, so I, I've I've somewhat done it before. My Loom Saga was actually published traditionally, but I joke that it was a traditional, non-traditional deal because it was with a small press. So I did have things like say over the cover and whatnot that authors usually never get when they're when they're at a, a larger house. Um, as far as as far as tiptoeing the line, it is interesting to me sometimes the seeing the extreme opinions that people will have of the how dare you go trad as if my choices somehow affect them <laughs> or, or vice versa. Um, and that does go back to to defining success, like I said, but it also, I see it as diversification of income where mm. if I have a publisher who gives me a good deal on a book and me defining good deal based off of, you know, my past numbers and past series performance and and what I think I could extrapolate, I could reasonably expect to make off of a series. I look at that as, may I lose money in the long term on that series? Yeah, it's possible. It's possible that I would make less money in the traditional world, but I see it as diversification of income because I am guaranteed that money as in an advance, as long as I turn in the book. And so that's one thing. The other factors are, you know, traditional publishing can reach audiences that we can't reach as indie. And that's still true. Um, You can't hit the New York Times anymore as indie because they're not really fans of indie authors. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And so I, 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 you know, and getting traditionally published doesn't guarantee you're going to hit the times by any stretch, but it's more of a possibility than if I stayed indie. So for me, it's very, I view it as I've weighed the pros and cons. Mm. I've adjust, like figured out how it fits into my personal publishing strategy. Is it the right strategy for everyone? Not at all. Um, but otherwise I'm just like, this is what these are the factors that I weighed out. This is what I want to do. I'm going to stay in my lane and do it. And if someone else gets their knickers in a twist about it, then <laughs> sorry, oh, not sorry. <laughs> well, I love that. That That's so awesome that you know who you are as an author and you are just willing to stick to, you know, what you know and what's best for you. That's amazing. And... I try. I don't always succeed, but I try. <laughs> no, that's really good. Well, Elise, it's been awesome chatting with you for 
wow, the past hour, we have almost gone over. This is really awesome though. You've dropped so much wisdom. We can't wait to share this episode. Uh, before we go, do you have any last words or anything else you want to share with our listeners? Um, I would say if you're writing, just good luck, develop your thick skin, thick skin and you know, hang in there. It's, it's hard. No matter what path you choose, it's a rough industry, but we all survive. Find a good community to rally around you and just hide behind them when you need to. Um, as far as stuff, if you want to find me, um, you can go to elisekova.com, E-L-I-S-E-K-O-V-A.com. And that has all of my social media links. I'm on Goodreads, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. It also has on the homepage, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, it has a link to my coaching if you're interested in that. Um, there's contact form on my website if you have a question or just hit me, you know, slide into my DMs. Um, <laughs> the whole, I'm sorry if I don't respond to you. It's not personal. I just am the worst sometimes with that. Um, but I'd, I'd love to chat with anyone online and, and good luck to everyone. And yeah, Air Awakens Vortex Chronicles finishes next year and I have 22 books out. I think it's 22 right now. And so check out one of them may speak to you. <laughs> Yeah, I will definitely include all of these links in the show notes. So it'll be really easy to just click over and see all the things. Well, thanks for having you on. We love chatting with you and have a lovely day. Thank you guys. The journey to becoming a full-time author on your own terms doesn't have to be lonely or hard. We have an awesome community where we chat daily, write together and motivate each other. To be part of this vibrant community of indie authors living their best bookish life on their own terms, go to indieauthorlifestyle.com forward slash inner circle for more information. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd love to hear more from you. Leaving a rating or a review helps us to create more great content like this. Be sure to rate this episode and subscribe to the show. Thanks for listening to the Indie Author Lifestyle Show. See you inside the community.